kid. Seriously. Hey, Mark, we just finished watching a show. It's our annual, our annual, it's our weekly recap of what is happening with season three of True Detective. We both recently just finished about 10 minutes ago, episode four, the hour and the day. As always, this is full spoilers from the get-go, so if you haven't seen it, turn us off now, or at least mute us so that we get those sweet, sweet views that we crave, but uh, we are going to spoil it right from the get-go. I will start with a recap, and then we will jump in with our thoughts and then read your comments. So I'm going to divvy this one up by decades, because I think that's the most easy way to go through this, and I'm going to start with the, the 2000s, because that is the smallest amount of time that we spent anywhere. I think it took us almost a half an hour to even get there. We open up with Henry in the 2000s, who I didn't realize, I don't think they told us, is a cop himself. And Wayne has wandered into his station to meet with Henry because he wants Henry to check out a list of names of people related to the Kate. The name that jumps out at us the most, though, is that he is looking for Roland West, which is Stephen Dwarf, his detective partner, because he wants to verify some information from him. And he makes a statement he doesn't know if he's alive or dead at this stage. So... His son begrudgingly agrees to look for these people and look for Roland. And then Wayne goes and visits the director or the host of the true crime show after they had their blowout in the previous episode. She reveals a little bit of information that we'll double back to that it, that is interesting, even though it crushes some of my theories. And then Wayne has a full meltdown in his office with visions of Vietnam soldiers. We don't know if the brown car he sees outside is a real car, if it's just his paranoia, if it's his dementia, if it is just the traumatic stress of having been a soldier in war. But things are not going well for Wayne's state of mind. He is deteriorating in the 2000s. And that's about all we did there. Now, I'm going to jump back to 1991, where Wayne is excited to be back on the case. And Amelia is not as excited. They have a bit of a bust-up in the kitchen in front of their kids as they don't seem to be on the same page about anything. Um, and we're, we'll deep dive into that a little bit later, too, because I, I have some thoughts on on them as a couple that we'll need to get into. They they get through that kind of in a weird, unfulfilling way for them personally. Um, and then we find out that Wayne is back on the task force. He's working with West to try and figure out what's going on because Julia's fingerprints have turned up. We do find out there was a conviction in Will's murder back in the 80s. Um, We also find out that the uncle, who I previously theorized in our first episode was going to be charged with the murder in the 80s, has been missing. So he is not the guy who is going to get arrested. Maybe we'll get an answer to that a little later in the episode. Um, And then we found out in the 2000s that his body was found in a shallow grave identified by teeth marks. And he went missing in 1990 after resurfacing is what they say. So we don't know how long he has been dead, but he is dead and buried and found in a grave. And this kind of ends in the 1991 storyline with Wayne finding the tape of Julia at the Walgreens going through or of Julie and, and actually seeing her walk by. So he sees her on the videotape. The majority of this episode takes place in 1980. We start with them visiting a church where the first communion pictures from the last episode were taken, and we meet a bit of a creepy priest who gives us some vibes that he could be in on it, but he is very helpful. We learn that Julia was excited about an aunt, even though she doesn't have an aunt that she was going to be visiting with, which could be some of the mysterious people she plays with in the woods. We meet Patty, the doll maker, who is described as a pleasant old lady, but maybe isn't quite that pleasant. She says she sold the dolls to a black man with a dead eye who bought ten of them at once. So West and Hayes go looking for him, and this brings them to an African-American low-income part of town where they have a confrontation with Sam, who is a one-eyed man that they find there. The community is not happy about police coming into there. There's a bit of a confrontation that might echo some of the things we see in modern-day America, but that ends, but it also leads at least me to believe that Sam was not the person in it. They talk about how a lot of people have injuries and things like that, and that description could fit multiple different people. 
They go back and they search the church some more. They're getting all the members of the church's fingerprints and information on them. We also see the first date of Wayne and Amelia, where he leaks a little bit of the case info to her. It seems to be about the only thing they can talk about together, as they have some awkward moments there. The father of the two missing children, Tom Purcell, is picked up in a bar by West after he gets beaten up for being drunk and aggressive. And then Amelia confronts Lucy with a box of art, the mother of the two children, and uh, she has a breakdown and Amelia gets thrown out of there. But what the, the big two things that happen in this episode is it draws to a conclusion. We find out the fingerprints on the bike belong to Freddie Burns, who was one of the three teenagers that we met in the first episode, the goth teenagers. They question him. And he breaks down as and says that basically he saw the kid in the woods and he decided to, you know, basically steal his bike and chase him off. And then he has a total breakdown as the cops intimidate him. And finally, we have the junk man who talks to some kids about buying some cans from them. The townspeople that threatened him before see it. They chase after him. He gets back to his house, which he sets up as basically a booby trap full of guns and landmine that he has attached to his door. The cops arrive to try and break it up, and we fade to black as the townsfolk kick in the door, and we hear an explosion. And that is where we left off. I have a million thoughts on this episode, but Mark, I'm going to start with you. What did you think of this one? I have a million thoughts, one for each minute. It felt like I spent watching this episode. (laughs) But this, for me, was a a real bit of a slog, and I, I think it was... Everything that you can think is wrong with this show really came to head in this particular episode. Um, I was alternately bored, frustrated, annoyed, a little confused, uh, you, you know, and I can I can break down all of that individually. But that's kind of my overall impression. I don't know. Are you you going that way or are you leaning the other way? I, I wasn't bored, but. I referred to last episode as the suspects episode because I felt like they threw a million suspects in a million different ways we could go with it. And this did a little bit of that, but this, to me, this episode was really about Amelia and Wayne. I think that is what they focused most of their, their time on. They have a, a, their relationship is not based on, on them having actual mutual interest in each other. It's the, the obsession with the case. That's why they start dating in the first place. That's why they're completely unhappy, uninterested, and don't even seem to know who each other are in 1991. Mm-hmm. And I, and that's that's where they took this episode. And I, I can understand why that is less interesting, because they gave us so much in the last episode of case-related things and leads to track, and then they barely followed up or touched on any of them. And the ones they did, for the most part, were dead ends. Like, the, the doll woman was a, a dead end. So I I found that a little disheartening, but I know it's going to pick up immediately, and this is just kind of us getting to care a little bit more about the characters. But I I have to say that my opinion of Amelia has declined over each episode, and I'm not sure if that's what they want for us. But, I mean, she is just someone trying to insert herself in the case, and that seems to be her only real motivation for anything she does in this episode like she doesn't seem to have real affection or love for Wayne or even her kids that much it just seems to me like she just wants to be part of the story that she's not a part of right and when he confronts her with that in the kitchen she all but confirms it by saying yeah at least I have ambition and want to go somewhere so two things for me one the the scene of their first date and I get what they're trying to achieve with it but it goes on so long and it, it really is a case of the, the creative team not being able to self-edit and not figuring out how they can get the point of this scene across in, in a more succinct way. It felt meandering, but not in a, an insightful or meaningful way. It just felt like it took too long to get to the points they were trying to make. The scene between them in 1991 in the kitchen and then in the bedroom, that to me felt completely inauthentic. I could see a writer's room working out each line of dialogue as they're delivering it. That didn't feel like an authentic interaction between two people. And that really put me off for the whole episode because we spend so much, like you said, we spend so much of the episode trying to um, you know, establish their relationship, which turns out to be not so great. Okay, but it, it wasn't in an authentic manner. The, the dialogue didn't ring true to me. 
the the whole they go into the bedroom to fight and then suddenly oh hey we're gonna make up have sex when it just turns on a whip like that i i I didn't buy any of it oh see i actually thought that the conclusion to the argument where she basically is just like fine let's have have sex and he's kind of like what you're crazy but then he he does it anyway i actually really liked that because to me for her it it just demonstrated how little she cared about this argument cared about his feelings cared about what he was going through and dealing with she just knew i can do this and it'll end it and and he even knew she was doing it but realized he wouldn't turn it down and we've talked a lot about how Mahershala Ali can convey so much with a look and, and not a saying. When they are done having sex and it just shows the two of them lying there together, the disinterest and contempt on both of their faces for each other and what has just happened, I, I it struck a chord with me. So I, I actually found that to be more fulfilling than a lot of the interactions we had with them in this episode. Oh, well, fair enough. I See, I went the complete opposite route at that um I I don't feel like even if I give them the benefit of the doubt, um, I don't feel like the show has necessarily established well enough the emptiness in their marriage to to devote a whole episode to it like this and have it pay off and ring true. It, it, it I don't feel like they've established it well enough to to make this kind of turn on it. Yeah, I th- I think you're right, and I think there is some pacing concerns there with just dumping basically an entire storyline in one episode and i don't think they're i think from the look of it next week we're going to go back to just examining weeds and they just kind of knocked it out in in one shot which you're right i think if you you took those individual scenes and maybe dispersed them throughout some other episodes it would be more effective was there anything else that jumped out at you of this episode either good or bad the other element that i had where i was really getting kind of frustrated with this episode is that At this point in the narrative, I feel like we should know who is sitting in jail in 1991. We don't need to know the details necessarily of how they got there, but to have them having these conversations in 91 and to have to kind of dance around the fact that they can't say who is in jail only because they don't want to tip off the audience means it's a more inauthentic kind of conversations between these cops. In real life, they would be talking about who is in jail. So it's a very blatant instance of, we don't want you, the audience, to know about it. We're going to play rhetorical tricks and go out of our way. We should know more of the details of the timeline, especially since it really appears at the end of this episode that they're going to do what it felt like they were going to do from the beginning, which is basically the West Memphis three angle and have the kids go to jail. It took us an episode too long to get to a place where we knew we were going and where it kind of should have already been. Yeah. And they've, they frame basically that there's going to be two major blowouts of uh, Hayes's career. One in, in 81 that gets him assigned a desk job and one in 91 that basically loses him his job. I'm assuming he, you know, he, he talks about how the 91 screw up is worse but they haven't really told us what it is, which makes me think we're also going to have a jam-packed episode probably next week where they dump all of that stuff on us because we're halfway through, so there isn't a ton of room left. So we're going to have to start getting some answers to move the story forward, and it's going to come fast and and furious. The, The one thing I wanted to mention that I liked about this episode and that I've been waiting for is this is the first episode that I drew awareness to the fact that Mahershala Ali is an African-American character in the 80s, in the South, in a rural town. At at some point, someone had to mention it or bring it up because, I'm sorry, I don't think you could exist in that world in that time period and not not have it be brought up. Have everyone ignore it like it doesn't happen, and we saw a lot of that. We saw the, the subtle racism of the of Patty, the doll maker who doesn't even realize how racist she's being when she talks about black people looking all the same. And they must obviously live in the poor black part of town. We have uh, Tom's breakdown where he uses the N word in reference to him out of anger, even though he's not in the car. And then we have the situation of him being an African American cop and how that appears to the African American low income population when they go and confront Sam over in the trailer park area. So I, I thought it was good that they put that on like the table. Mm-hmm. And I was I was glad they addressed it, and I liked the way they addressed it in this episode. Yeah. Well, no, that that is true. I also, and I actually think that the best part of that too that they did is the one you didn't 
mention, which is when they're driving through the town. And he says, well, what are we going to do? You know, Mahershala Ali's character says, well, what are we going to do? You know, just start knocking on doors. And Stephen Dorff says, well, why don't we go to the liquor store? First? Yeah. And then immediately he kind of turns on him and says, well, calls him out for it. And I, I think that that was actually was was really great because it shows how even when you're in the, the company of people who are your friends or are your partners, how quickly something can turn and you can suddenly see that, well, maybe they are you know more racist than I thought, or you know maybe they are harboring more feelings. And just that, that brief interaction I thought was, it felt like something really authentic and something that somebody in his position in the 80s in the South w- would kind of constantly have to be on edge for. And I thought that was terrific. But yeah, I think you're right. Obviously they, they haven't addressed it as much as I think they should have. And it, it was nice to see that there. Also, too, uh, I also noticed that when they're at the restaurant, you go, you pan through the whole restaurant yeah. to find him and Amelia at the back table. Yep, the only African-American couple. Right, yep. which was another, I, I think they did a really good job of, you know, both overtly and, and subvertly putting that in there in this episode. And I just sort of wish that, again this whole pacing thing that they were spreading it out more through the episodes. Let's move to our comments. If you leave us a comment, we will read it no matter what it says, unless it's racist or something horrible, but you know, you can tell us we suck or whatever, and we will read it out. We had a comment this week from Larry Romano who wrote West and Amelia were involved with the cover up. Hayes will be set up by then for not solving it. He will realize it hopefully soon. The show is pretty tedious. Once you realize what's going on, (laughs) I, I think you would agree with, uh, with with Larry, especially after this episode, that it can be a little slow, and I I bet Larry struggled through this episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm guessing this was not Larry's favorite. Uh, I don't know that I I agree 100 percent with his police work there, but it's an interesting thought, and I've got a feeling that he's maybe got a, a few nuggets in there that might become relevant, even if he doesn't have the overall picture. Yeah, yeah, and we need we still need to figure out, you know, even if Amelia and, and West helped cover it up, or I don't think they covered up the murder themselves, but if he's implying they covered up who was convicted and whatnot to, you know, West to further his career and Amelia, well, to further her career and her book, I can buy that, but we still got to figure out who the who killed those kids and what happened to them. Or, so I, I think even if you have that part figured out, there's still mysteries, Larry. Hang in there. I think it's going to pick up starting in episode five. That is going to do it for us on this episode, which was kind of a long one, but these episodes are getting more exciting. We have four more to go. We will bring you all the latest for the next episode of True Detective. And again, leave us a comment, and we will read it for you next time. Bye.